talked about images, talked about audio, how about language? So I want to share with you an approach to using deep learning, feature learning for language that I'm excited about. Uh, and this is actually the work of Richard Socher, who's a, who's a Stanford grad student. So um, how do we learn good representations for sentences? In order to build up to that, I'm going to assume that we already have a feature representation for words. There are various standard ways of doing this. Uh, there are things like distributional representations, or in this community, there are things like the uh, uh, neural language models uh, by Yoshi Benjo, Colbert, Weston, and so on. But so I'm not going to talk about those, but, but just to say what these feature representations of words look like. Given a couple words like Monday and Britain, uh, you know, traditionally, the brain dead representation would be to represent them using basis feature vectors, right? 0, 0, 0, then 1, and 0, 0, 0. But instead, what various of these algorithms like distributional representation, neural language models, and so on do is learn a low dimensional embedding of a word. So a word Monday may be associated with a feature vector like 2, 4. And a word like Britain may be associated with a feature vector like 9, 2. And then maybe Tuesday, which is similar to Monday, would have a feature vector, you know, similar to Monday. And France would have a feature vector, 9.5, 1.5, this close to Britain. And the word on may have a different feature vector. Okay, so they're kind of standard algorithms to do this at this point. And so given a sentence like on Monday, Britain, blah, 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 you would represent those words using these feature vectors that I just wrote down. So I'm going to use this as a starting point. Um, and use any, any of a number of standard algorithms to get these uh, feature vector representations. I, I bet there are some other speakers talking about how to do this later. I'm going to use this as a starting point and talk about how to learn good representations for sentences. So given a sentence like the cat sat on the mat, you, know, you have some set of feature representations for these words. And if you want to use a neural network or a deep network or whatever, Right, what you do is throw on top a number of nodes like that, like sparse coding maybe, and then on top of that, another layer. And if you look at that node where the arrow is pointing, right, we think of it as, and so this is a, a, the idea of um, maybe local receptive fields. I think Jan had talked about this, where instead of each node having dense connections to the layer before, each node is connected only to a local neighborhood of words in the sentence, right? And so now, if you look at the node where the arrow is pointing, is the, node, is the job of that node to represent the sentence fragment cat sat on. But the phrase cat sat on doesn't mean anything, right? It's not a proper English phrase. So it's not clear what, 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 what are we hoping for that node to possibly accomplish when it's seeing the sentence fragment that doesn't mean anything. So um, Richard's thinking was that for sentences, for language in particular, language is endowed with a natural hierarchy, and it may therefore make sense to have the neural network respect the natural hierarchy that is the pause tree associated with the sentence. So the cat is a phrase, the mat is a phrase, on the mat is a phrase, and so on. And so if you have a neural network whose structure is like this, then if you look at that note where the arrow is pointing, um, that node's job is to represent the phrase on the mat. And now, the phrase on the mat, it actually has a meaning. You can think about, oh, what does it mean to be on the mat? And you can think about constructing something to represent that phrase. So what do you want to do? We want to construct meanings or representations of different phrases in the sentence. How do we construct representations? Well, how do you represent phrases? I'm going to use a feature vector, right? Like everything else, you know, everything we've been representing, our representation is always a feature vector. So let's look at these phrases like on the mat and come up with a feature vector, in this case the vector 8, 3, with which to represent the phrase on the mat. Here's an illustration of what we'd like to do, right? So this is, um, I should say, this slide is aspirational. I'm not saying we can do this, but this is what we'd like to do, which is to be able to take us in for the phrase like the day after my birthday and compute the feature representation, say 3, 5, so that when you plot that feature representation, it somehow realizes that the day after my birthday is something similar to Monday and Tuesday. Whereas something like the country of my birth would ideally have a feature vector that is close to Britain and France, because that's like a similar sort of thing. Okay, so this is what we'd like an algorithm to do. So um, what Richard showed, Richard Social showed, was that it's actually possible to, de to develop an algorithm that does this. The basic, let, let me color in these nodes just for purposes of illustration. 
the basic unit of computation for an algorithm that, that does this, called a recursive neural net, is a neural network. So the basic computation unit is the neural network that takes as input the representations of two children nodes, so the on and the phrase the mat, right? And it's the job of the neural network to output two things. So it's output first a yes or no. Should we be putting a common parent on top of these two nodes? And second, um, if we do choose to merge these two nodes, meaning if we do take those two children and, and uh, give them a common parent, what feature vector do you want to use to represent the common parent? Okay, so the neural network has output these two things. So you can train up this neural network, then when you're given a new English sentence, you can apply this to the phrase, the cat. You'll say, yes, the cat is a phrase, and the feature I want is 5-2. Cat sat, no, that's not a phrase in the sentence. Sat on, no, no, yes, the mat is a phrase in the sentence. Um, and you can now build up a pause tree using this neural network. So you can, so you can if, if you respect the neural network's yes decisions, you now have that. And then you can run on the game. You know, no, no, yes, so on the mat is a phrase. So let's put 8-3 on top. No, oh, sorry. Um, and so on, and you can build up the tree and the uh, representations of the nodes and of the sentences in the tree. Now that you have this algorithm, the interesting thing is that every English sentence and every English phrase now has a feature vector representation. Right? So what you can do is um, let's pick a sentence, pick a sentence from the Wall Street Journal corpus. I'm going to call the sentence that we manually selected the center sentence. So in the middle column, the center sentence is a sentence that you know, we, collect, we selected manually. What we're going to do is uh, pause a large corpus of text and then look at the feature representation for the center sentence and see what other sentences have similar feature vectors as this you know, manually selected center sentence. Okay? And what you see is that, you know, so both took further hits yesterday is similar to we're in for a lot of turbulence and so on. On this, uh, on this diagram, the leftmost column was uh, our human written interpretation of what's similar, right? So the leftmost column is a human label. Um, this example at the bottom, Columbia, South Carolina is similar to unknown word Maryland. So UNK is uh, when the tokenizer has never seen that word before, it tokenizes it as UNK. But someone knows that even though you don't know what that word is, even though it's a word you've never seen before, Columbia, South Carolina is similar to unknown word Maryland because they're both probably cities. Okay? And just a few other examples. So on the top, um, has the client comment is similar to number four, Coastal wouldn't disclose the terms. Uh, those are two sentences with no, without even a single word in common, right? So if Hess declined to comment and Coastal wouldn't disclose the terms, those are phrases that mean similar things, but they don't have a single word in common, but sort of recognizes that the features for them should be similar. Is this being trained as something like an autoencoder? What's the uh, loss function that's being minimized? Uh, right, complicated. So, so let's see, this, this particular diagram was generated using a, a recursive neural network trained using backpropagation through structure, trained on a uh, pen tree bank uh, label parse tree data. There are other versions that work without parse trees as well. And the um, optimization objective so is... You have labels for what the correct parse trees are. For this particular example, but there are other versions that uh, work on just unlabeled text. And what is asked to predict, there are a few supervision signals, but one is uh, when you have labeled data, you know, one thing is asked to predict is these yes-no labels. Should, should these have a, have a common parent? For the fully unsupervised versions, uh, you train it on an autoencoder reconstruction objective. Cool. And then it turns out that these features you learn for the phrases and so on uh, uh, seem to capture semantic meaning. And so you can use these features for a variety of NLP tasks as well. So, you know, paraphrase detection is one of those competitions that NLP people compete on. You do 0.1% better, you write a paper, there's a lot of work on this, all sorts of features. And uh, Richard Socher found that by learning the features, you could do better. Right. You, you hear these soul stories a lot. This is a serious competition, right? That people actually, uh, top NLP groups actually spend a lot of time engineering. And there are a bunch of examples like that. Well, it turns out that these algorithms now are the state of the art in sentiment classification on pretty much, I think, every single sentiment classification benchmark that, that we've tried it all on. It's just, you know, it's a bunch of things like that. 
Um, turns out that the same idea also applies to images. So shown on top is a hierarchy, right? The pause tree that is associated with you know sentence, a small crowd by the entrance of the church. Turns out the images can also be decomposed into a hierarchy, in which you can take an take an image, break down the image into the objects in the image, and then objects can be further broken down into object parts and object subparts. And so, in the same way, I'm not sure you can see the slide. But, um, you have a scene, the scene can be broken down into the church, the trees and the people, and then the church building can be broken down into you know, the different parts of the building all the way down to a low level thing like a window of the church. And in the same way as how you can learn a feature representation for language, you can learn this sort of recursive representation for these image fragments as well, in which you can learn the representation for, this, for these fragments, for these image fragments, and then you have a neural network combine them to learn a joint representation for the uh, image fragment that's one level up and so on until you get a representation for the roots of the tree, which is the entire image. So earlier for sentences, we had this sort of diagram where we look at one sentence and ask what are the nearby sentences. So you can do the same for image, for images, for actually image superpixels. So on the leftmost column is a you know, selected patch. I'm going to compute the feature representation for the selected patch using this algorithm. And you can then ask what other image patches have similar features to the selected patch shown on the left. And it turns out, if you do that, you, know, you find the first row is on a yellow sign, second row is car tires, the third row is all fragments of cars, um, the fifth row is fragments of beige colored buildings, and so on. Um, and so you're able to learn features for these sorts of super pixel type image fragments that again you know, capture useful features. Yes. And once again, these features turn out to be useful for you know various uh, uh, standard benchmarks. This is a Stanford background data set. It wasn't collected by me. It's collected by Stephen Gould, working with Daphne Collar. I had nothing to do with this data set, but you know, semi standard benchmark. Um, MSRC data set against state of the art. This is, this, both of these are smaller data sets, I should say. Right? So these sorts of algorithms are giving, uh, this sorts of, uh, I think this idea of recursion is pervasive in, in language and images and so on, and these algorithms that capture them can, can start to learn recursive representations of, of our world. Right? Um, all right, so, um, I say this last the, the, the last few bits are gonna I'm, I'm gonna jump around from topic to topic to topic a bit because just I, I kind of selected out the you know uh, the, a few of the fun researchy things that I thought I want to tell you about so I'm gonna jump topics a little bit and tell you a bit about um, uh, want to talk about text because a few people had asked me earlier um, want to say a few say a few words about you know analysis of feature learning algorithms and. Um, I'd already talked a bunch about scalability, and I want to relate to you a story um, for my experience working with Adam that, that really maybe drove home the scalability issue for me personally, right? So um, you saw this already, right? Oh, slide's messed up. But uh, you saw this already that you know, back in, what, like uh, uh, 10, 11 years ago, uh, Michelle Branco and Eric Bro, right, showed that for supervised learning, is really the training set size that matters more than the learning algorithm, at least for, for this application. Um, and um, so in this brave new world of unsupervised feature learning, you know, we have all these algorithms, right? And you know, this, uh, this is work that Adam Coase did like a year and a half ago. And about a year and a half ago, we're a bunch of us at conferences were debating, gee, which algorithm is better? And um, if you look at all, almost all of the algorithms, Right, almost all of the algorithms, sparse autoencoders, uh, uh, like RBMs, whatever, most of them learn these sorts of um, edge detectors as the first layer. Right, and then throughout uh, the, the the next couple of weeks, you'll be seeing a lot of pictures that look like this, where people say, "I ran sparse coding, or I ran sparse whatever," and um, proudly show off my good boy edge detectors, uh, my my my, um, and so. Um, Adam Coase did this interesting experiment. You took a bunch of these algorithms, sparse autoencoder, sparse RBM, um, and then we kind of asked, what's the simplest, dumbest learning algorithm on the planet, uh, unsupervised learning algorithm? K-means, right? That's like the first learning algorithm taught in every machine learning class. And 
found that surprisingly, when you train k-means on whitened data, whitening is a pre-processing step that that's an online tutorial I don't want to talk about. But when you use like the simplest dumbest learning algorithm, k-means, um, that even that also learns the edge detectors. And this was a surprise. To, this was a huge surprise to us at the time because we thought, oh, we need to do the sparse coding stuff. Um, and I guess it's only fairly recently, I think Nando de Freitas has a theoretical analysis explaining why you know, k-means is like an extreme version of sparse coding that kind of lends more uh, the theoretical analysis, so it casts more understanding why this is the case. But um, uh, it was a big surprise to me back then that like, literally the dumbest learning algorithm I could think of was giving substantially similar results to algorithms that you know, we worked hard on and were pretty proud of. Um, and, then, and then also this chart that I showed earlier, what I did not draw attention to earlier was that that top performing line was actually k-means. Um, mm -hmm. right? So um, what does this mean? And I think the reason that k-means does so well is because uh, we were able to you know, train k-means longer, train it to convergence, uh, uh, more so than the other algorithms, mainly because of, and, and, and there are some other details that are in the papers, I should say, that's not the only reason. Um, but, but somehow, you know, really this lesson that the bigger you can build the model, the better. And the algorithm does matter. Uh, um, there is the difference in performance between this, these different algorithms, but, but somehow k-means, at the time, a year and a half ago when this work was published, um, others have surpassed these results since then. But at the time, this was the slide I made, and this was the state of the art you know, two reasonably respectable benchmarks. Uh, mainly because we could train it bigger than all the simpler models. Jan? Right, so, so for mid-level features, at least for computer vision, uh, the systematic result is that every time people use KVs and replace it with sparse coding, it works better with sparse coding. So it's difficult to make general statements because you know, there's certain experiments depending on the details, depending on the exact thing to do, but, uh, but at least for mid-level features, we will establish that sparse coding was better than yeah, right. Yeah, I, I think it depends on the details. So having said that, let me just add, I don't think k-means is the right algorithm. I think it's a terrible algorithm. I've, I personally have stopped working on k-means. Um, but, uh, but for me, the, the, the surprise was really that, you know, depending on, uh, uh, depending on the details, right, which do matter. I, I actually agree with what Jan said. For mid-level features, sparse coding on SIFT works better than k-means on SIFT. Uh, but then there are other funkier versions of k-means than the most basic one, and so the the the. the I see. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, oh, and, and actually, there's this new thing, which is a uh, k-means of local receptive field learning that seems to work much better as well. It's like a NIPS paper last year at Adam Go. So. Uh, so anyway, so this is why um, uh, the kind of personal. Uh, please don't don't take away the message from this that k-means is the right algorithm you should use. I don't think it is, um, and I think you know it seems to work very well for the first level. For the second level, you can make k-means work if you do some, I think, pretty complicated things. If you do local receptive field learning, if you decide which, um, uh, if you have a pretty complicated algorithm, so you have your first level features, your A1 through A1000, say, if you have a pretty complicated algorithm to select out which subsets of them to run k-means on, you can get k-means to do well at high levels, but it gets more complicated. So the message is not that k-means is a good algorithm, but rather that, you know, at least at one point in history, one and a half years ago, k-means was the best algorithm just because it was computationally feasible to run it much bigger than the other algorithms. Right? So because of experience like this, um, I ended up kind of really uh, uh, spending a lot of time thinking about scalability and uh, uh, um, how to build bigger models. And so one of the things we did was um, what we called tau convolutional uh, networks. And uh, Marco Aurelio Ronzato, who's a young student, actually independently came up with the same idea. I think we actually independently both managed to call it the same name as well. Um, but let me, let me <clears throat> share with you, you know, this one piece of the, of the scalability picture. Right? So um, for unsupervised feature learning, we want to learn invariant features. Right? We want to learn features that are robust to changes in the position of a feature, or ch robust to changes in orientation or whatever. Right? And I guess you've heard Jan talk about confnets yesterday. And I think there are two reasons why we use confnets. I think one of the reasons is a good reason, and one of the reasons is a reason that you know, I don't like. I think a good reason for using confnets is that it reduces the number of ways that need to be learned. 
because what the confinet does is essentially ties a lot of weights throughout your network. We are saying that the feature you detect at this position is the same as the feature you detect at that position, same as the feature you detect at that position. And this kind of makes sense because, you know, vertical edges are probably the same anywhere in the image, so you don't need to learn a separate vertical edge detector for the upper left-hand corner of the image as you do for the lower right-hand corner of the image. So by tying all of these parameters, uh, a confinet dramatically reduces the number of parameters in your model, and thus maybe you need much less, much less unlabeled data to train your confinet, right? So it, I think, I think uh, that's a good reason to use confinets. There's a second reason to use confnets, which is one that I don't think is a good one, which is that it hard codes translation invariance. Right? So what a confnet does is says, one of the things it says is, let's say I've learned a feature detector. I'm going to copy my feature detector over by you know, four pixels, and I'm going to detect the same feature, shift it four pixels over. And then I'm going to take the max of these two features. So take the sum of squares, the square root of sum of squares or something of these two features. We're going to add up these two features. And the effect of that is that you have hard-coded uh, translation invariance into your, into your feature detector, right? Because it's saying, whether you detect the vertical edge here or shifted a few pixels over, I'm going to add them up. Um, and so now I have a slightly translation invariant edge detector that detects the same edge whether it's shifted a few pixels or not, okay? So I actually think that uh, this is not a good reason to use confidence. And the reason is, you know, when, when we look at computer vision, we, we kind of know that um, compute object recognition is translation invariant. It was, you know, this, this, this thing, right? Whether you, no matter how I move it, no matter how I translate this object, we know it's the same object. So it's very tempting, it's very seductive to like, oh, let's code in translation invariant because we know object detection has to be that way. But what I see is that there's this very seductive path where um, it turns out that there are only five or six types of invariants that we know how to code up. Uh, translation, scale, rotation, um, luminance, brightness, contrast. I think that's it, right? Those are like the five or six types of invariants that we know how to code up. And there's this very seductive path that I see people go down where first you code up translation invariants, you get a bit better performance. And then you, know, you go to your thesis advisor and say, oh, let's, let's code up rotation invariants as well, because I know object detection is rotation invariant. Then you spend another six months doing that, and then finally your thing is object rotation invariant, and then it works a little bit better. And then you say, oh yeah, I need to do better contrast you know, invariants. You code up something with that. And then about three years in, you've coded up, finally coded up all six of these things. And then everyone's experience is that after you've done that, everyone hits the same brick wall, right? Because those are the only ones you know how to code up. Instead, I think the far more interesting forms of invariance are things like out-of-plane rotation. So all the plane rotation is if, if I rotate my face out of plane, right? You know I'm still a human and I'm still, still the same person. But this sort of out-of-plane rotation is something uh, that, that, is very, that we don't know how to code up and that I think we should learn. Um, and so rather than spending a lot of engineering effort coding up the few things that we do know how to code up, I personally would prefer to just learn them all uh, uh, instead of expending limit engineering effort seeing the brick wall that you're going to hit in a few months or in a few years' time. Right? Um, and, and then the other, and the other thing is, uh, I guess, uh, hard coding translation invariance, in some limited ways, it actually seems to make it harder to learn more complex types of invariance, even rotational invariance. Right? And so what we did was try to figure out a way to preserve the computational scaling advantage of confidence, but to also allow it to learn more complex invariances than only translation invariants. So let me share with you this, um, this idea called a tiled uh, uh, confidence. So um, let's see. Okay, so let me illustrate this with a, with, a, with a bunch of pictures, I guess. So here's a neural network. This is actually a TICA network, but you know, say a neural network. And um, if you have the input pixels, which is densely connected to the simple cell units, first layer features, and then pooling units, which you know, sum up or take square, square root of sum of squares of a bunch of your feature detectors. So if you do this, then um, each one of your feature detectors will learn a different feature, I've shown a bunch of different features on the upper right. But this doesn't scale to large images, because every uh, feature has to take as input the entire image 
And so, you know, you can't feed in a, a, like a one megapixel, a thousand by thousand image, because then every simple cell would need to be like a thousand by thousand thing, right, it's doing. So, um, first of the algorithm is let's switch to local receptor fields. So instead of connecting every single feature detector to every single pixel, let's use a local receptor field in which we're going to take these dense connections at the bottom, at this bottommost layer, and replace them with local connections. Um, so that each of the uh, low-level features is um, connected only to a few, uh, only to a few pixels in, a, in a, like a local neighborhood of pixels. Okay. Now we still have a fairly large number. Of, now we've reduced the number of parameters. This scales better to uh, large images. But um, but let's see what else we can do, right? If we were to use a confnet, if we were to tie all the weights, then what that's saying is that we want every single one of our feature detectors to detect the same feature, okay? Um, and so I'm using the shading in this row to detect to denote different feature detectors. So the fact that all five nodes in this middle row have the same shading that denotes that this is a confnet that I've tied all of my weights so that all of them have the same uh, are detecting the same edge. And uh, when you then do pooling on top of this, this does not allow you to learn anything other than translation and variance. Right? So what we did was uh, we said, instead of tying all the weights, let's tie the weights, but at some regular tile size. So let's say that you know, at a tile size of two, um, every second unit or every third unit or every 10th unit must have the same parameters as so as, as, as your other feature detectors, kind of modulo 2 in this example, or it can be modulo 10 or whatever. And what this does is, um, if you now look at what a pooling unit is doing, right? so if you look at this green node on top, um, this green node can now see a range of different features. And so this green node can maybe look at a vertical edge, look at a um, uh, you know, 80 degree edge, look at a 70 degree edge, and now pull over these different edges to learn other types of invariance as well than just, um, uh, than just translation invariance. Okay? And so this is a tiled convolutional nets idea and, and kind of is a, is a useful way to scale up models by still tying a lot of parameters because here we have only two distinct feature detectors, right? We have two shadings in the middle row, so you still have a relatively small number of parameters, but it means that you're not constrained to pooling only over identical copies of the same feature detector shifted to different locations. Instead, you can now pull over features that capture more interesting types of invariance. Okay? And then finally, um, uh, you, know, you learn not just one feature detector per position, you learn multiple feature detectors per position. So you can this is called it the map size. Okay? Um, and anyway, once upon a time, when we did this work and wrote this paper, it did well. Um, all right, so on the scaling dimension, I think, oh, hey, Jeff. Uh, so on the, on the scaling dimension, um, uh, yeah, actually, well, Jeff, I think when, when, while you weren't here, I think I said that my proudest achievement at Google was that I recruited you to join us as a losing faculty member there. Um, but, but, I see, yes, oh, I did not see you wear your funny hat. We should get a picture of that. <laughs> anyway. So, um, the, the, at the, I guess some of you have heard about this result already. I want to talk a bit about it. But so, you know, because of the scalability thing at Google, um, I ended up putting together a team uh, to try to, um, uh, uh, what is it, build very large scale neural networks, build very large scale deep learning models. And, um, and so, let me just, some of you already have heard the result. Let me just quickly summarize it. So, this is basically a, three-layer stacked uh, TICA model, um, or, or uh, Jan points out is also equivalent in some sense to a sparse autoencoder model. And uh, we asked ourselves the question this, of uh, what can we do if we train a massive model on a massive amount of data? All this is unsupervised, right? So no labels. Um, and and you know, well, I was curious, can we learn a grandmother cell? Right, what's one question screw as well? So in, in computer vision, you know, I don't know, a large data set is like maybe 10,000 images, maybe 100,000 images. Um, we trained on 10 million images. And um, again, if you look in the deep learning literature, you know, a million parameters is fairly typical. 
some of the largest models have like 10 million parameters. 10 million parameters is a lot of parameters. Um, we trained on 1.15 billion parameters. It's a large model. And so um, uh, this is really a team effort of about like, 10 people working for a year, year and a half to build up the infrastructure. And then Quark Li was the, was the lead author on this work. And so Quark took 1,000 machines, trained them for a week on um, images like those shown on the left, random YouTube thumbnails. And the test set was, uh, and, and, then, and then tested on a, on a novel test set to see if you could identify neurons that were selected for this or that. Right? And so, you know, faces is probably the most common object in YouTube videos. And if you test this um, and uh, probing through, I guess, so we, we took a, so the test set was labeled, the training set is unlabeled, right? Training set is just unlabeled YouTube thumbnails, un unlabeled YouTube images. Uh, in the test set, we found a collection of um, some faces as well as a bunch of random images and probed each neuron in the neural network in the, in the third layer to see if there was any neuron that's highly selective for a face. And yes, indeed there was. So shown on the left was yeah, one particular neuron responded most strongly to those images shown here on the left. And there was one false positive, but just, I think that's a computer mouse that, I don't know, that, that it responded strongly to. Uh, and if you use numerical optimization, and Yosha Benjo pioneered this technique, but if you use numerical optimization to try to find the input image that maximally activates this neuron, then you know, this, was, um, this was what we found, that that, that input image maximally activates this, this thing. So just to summarize what this means, right? it means that you know, we train an algorithm, a huge one, on a ton of video, on a ton of images, and the algorithm, quote, invented the notion of face detection by itself. Right? Um, this is actually the histogram of this particular neuron's responses to you know, faces or to random distractors. And so all the things that responds to most strongly are faces. Um, this, as a face detector, the performance of this is significantly worse than supervised learning, right? Because you know, if you train a supervised learning algorithm with hundreds of thousands of labeled faces, that does much better than this at face detection. But the, 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 the thing I was happy with about this was that this was unsupervised teacher learning. It was never told in advance what a face was. Okay? So, um, you know, what else? Uh, oh, and, and so um, earlier this morning, there was a question about invariance properties of these face detectors. And so kind of documented, you know, that the, the, the face detector that's learned is somewhat invariant uh, to, you know, uh, translation to scale factor, less so to scale factor changes, yeah. somewhat rotate and variant of 3D rotations. Um, and then, let's see, what else? Um, and then, well, I think you, you've heard about this already, but you know, what's the, after faces, what's the second most common object in YouTube, you know? Um, <laughs> so shown on the left is the top stimuli from the test set. This is a numerical optimization. The, the cat face is kind of hard to see here, but basically learned the cat detector from unlabeled data. And it was, again, it was never told what a cat is. There was no labeled data. Um, and so that's the histogram of responses of, uh, of this particular neuron to a random distractor versus cat faces. And then finally, we looked around for a few other things. We also found a pedestrian detector. Uh, I guess because people, pedestrians, or maybe the back of pedestrians are common in uh, uh, video and images. Um, and then that's the histogram. I should say, we also looked around for a car detector. We thought there might be a lot of cars in YouTube, and we did not find a car detector. Uh, maybe because the algorithm wasn't run big enough, maybe because we didn't have the right data, maybe because we don't have the right algorithm. No, don't know. Okay. And I think, you know, so it turns out that um, to get this particular result, I don't think there was much algorithmic innovation, actually. The, the algorithm we were using was an algorithm called Rika that we published a, a while ago. Jan pointed out to me is extremely similar to something that his student Corey had done. Um, uh, is a you know TIC algorithm with local contrast normalization. The only, the only really I feel like the main innovation needed to get this result was just the scaling. And I suspect that the reason um, it's been difficult to get to learn these high level concepts is because if you do something as diverse as YouTube video, there's a ton of stuff in YouTube, right? There. Are, I don't know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of objects in YouTube. And so if you learn a model with a thousand features, you're not going to find a cat. Instead, you're going to get edges and contours and these vague shapes that commonly occur. But 
there's so many different objects. So I think you need a commensurate size representation. You need a massive number of neurons if you want to have a hope of you know, discovering faces or discovering cats and so on. Um, and I think ex exactly the same model, if you were to scale down the model and train this model with only a thousand neurons, you find that the deepest layers will, will, will be edges and contours and these big blurry shapes that, that do occur commonly, but not something as selective as a human face or a cat face or a pedestrian. Great. Um, so, oh yes, and then uh, and it turns out that um, doing the self-taught learning thing, this set of features you can imagine is very useful for uh, object recognition. So the largest ImageNet benchmark currently has 20,000 classes. Um, and so it's a 20,000 way classification problem. And you can imagine, so you know, we learned a huge number of features. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, we figured out what just three of these neurons are maybe roughly looking for. The vast majority of these features, there's some complicated nonlinear function of the input. I have no idea what the vast majority of these features are looking for. But if we have a cat detector, a face detector, you know, a pedestrian detector, I mean, these seem like pretty useful features for various tasks. I don't know, do we have an eye detector or a round object detector or a vertical you know, structure detector? I don't know. All of these things may be in there. We just don't know how to, we, we don't have good enough visualization tools, I guess, to figure out what most of these features are doing. But we strongly suspect that they are very useful, that these features learn completely from unlabeled data. We strongly suspect that they may be very useful for um, classification tasks. And so on the uh, ImageNet data set, the previous state of the art was, um, shoot, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get the numbers wrong. I think it was you know, nine point something percent. Uh, there's one number that I, that, that I do know we have right. And by learning the features and, uh, um, by learning the features and uh, uh, using that to build a classifier on top, we were able to raise the accuracy by 70%, right? So nearly, not quite double, but nearly double the accuracy from, I'm gonna get these numbers wrong, from like 9.6% to 15.8% or something like that. Um, human level performance is also very low because many of these categories are very difficult. In ImageNet, one of the categories is triangle, another category is isosceles triangle. So, you know, even human level performance, is, is, is some of the classes are ambiguous but uh, it's, it's really by far the state of the art in, in, in this particular large-scale ImageNet benchmark. Can I ask two questions? One is, do you have an idea about the human level performance? You know, I don't know. Um, uh, within, the, within, within the Google group we're chatting, our completely um, unsubstantiated guess was that it might be 30%, but that's based on gut feeling more than anything. Second question is about... Yeah. Uh, so if you, let's say, I mean, you, you said you were maybe looking for something like the grandmother cell. I just feel that it may be hard to visualize it by taking the recept, like taking the, uh, the average, I guess, of the, or the maximum of the activations. I, I, don't, like, I don't remember how exactly you do you, you that. But, but if you have a grandmother cell that responds to very different visual sort of setups of the grandmother, then if you just average that, you, you may just get, I mean, nothing, not a specific, picture of it, I'm just saying it's maybe really difficult to visualize it. It might not be the thing that you may want to do. You know, so it's been, it's been surprising that, uh, so this space, this right, was um, obtained this, on the right, that was obtained by numerical optimization. And if you have a face detector um, that responds to a face at any number of positions, right, or faces at different expressions or something, then I think the, the, the thing that maximally activates it will likely be some face in some position rather than the average of all possible faces, which would be a smear, right? Because the average of all possible faces is like some blurry thing that is not a face, and so it's less likely to activate this neuron if it really is a face-detected neuron. And so maybe this is a local optimum. Maybe if the face were actually shifted over a little bit, you know, it would, um, uh, it would activate this neuron even more strongly. But I think by doing this sort of numerical optimization, you end up, you, it, it works more often than I, uh, then my, one might guess, I guess. Well, in light of that, can you offer some insight as to why the optimal stimulation for the cat neuron is so blurry? Um, yeah, I don't know. Don't look good as it is. It, it might be just a less reliable cat detector, or maybe cats move around more or something. I don't really know. Oh, and certainly, you, know, you look at the cats. You have some black cats, you have some white cats, and then, I don't know, not sure. Yeah, that's a good question. 
I think there are, and I think there are substantially fewer cats in uh, YouTube than there are people. So this is harder to learn a cat detector than a human face detector. All right. So um, the, there were just two more things I wanted to do. One is, uh, over the years, I've been, I've been going around and giving talks about this sort of unsupervised feature learning research agenda for a long time, for like five, six years now. And over the years, I've heard many um, criticisms, weaknesses and criticisms of this sort of research agenda. And uh, I want to share some of these with you, um, partly also because, you know, as, as after you uh, graduate from this uh, uh, workshop and you are doing these things yourselves, you may, in case you hear some of these, you, you know how I, you, you now have the, you know, uh, one possible set of responses to, to criticisms that you may hear as well, yes. Um, so one thing that I, actually, one thing that I used to hear a lot, that I hear less often now, is the criticism that, you know, you're learning everything. Um, it's better to encode prior knowledge about the structure of images or audio or text or whatever, right? We know so much about images, let's just encode the prior knowledge about that. And I talked a bit about that just now already, about, you know, there are only so many things we know. And, and I feel like there was a similar debate um, about 20 years ago between, you know, the dumb machine learning guys like me, or maybe like many of us, and the linguists who were constructing very complex theories of language. And 20 years later, it's very clear which argument has carried the day, right? Today, by far the most successful um, approaches to NLP are ones that use tons of data uh, and maybe very, very simple theories of language, like there's a parse tree or something, but certainly a far simpler uh, a hand-coded model of language than the linguists were envisioning using 20 years ago, right? I mean, so there's this complex linguistic theory saying, you know, oh, if, if the word follows a subjunctive past tense and is modified by a determiner, then whatever, right? And, and then those things, most frankly, most of that work is just forgotten today and it's just not useful. Um, so one thing I've learned from that is that often it's better to let the data speak instead of imposing your own preconceptions to just let the data speak. And in fact, for a problem like computer vision, you know, if you think computer vision is a sufficiently simple problem that you can implement everything you need your computer to know about images, then maybe hand engineering stuff is a good approach. But otherwise, I think it's better to, um, to let the, have algorithms learn this stuff from data. The second classic criticisms that I've often heard are that, you know, unsupervised feature learning cannot come and do X, where X is those things on the list below. And, and over the years, you know, we, the community, has been striking these things off one at a time. Um, we ourselves, as well as our colleagues and friends, we keep on adding things to the bottom of this list, right? We strike things off and we keep on adding things to the bottom of this list. But I'm not currently aware of a fundamental limitation of these sorts of algorithms uh, uh, in that vein anyway, for, for, for handling perceptual data. Um, so, but, but having said that, I think there's clearly work to be done. I think, you know, deep learning, feature, unsupervised feature learning is an immature field and it's clearly work to be done. And then one third one that I suspect many of you will care less about, but I hear a lot about in Silicon Valley, is that we don't understand the learned features. There are these complex nonlinear functions, we have no idea what it's doing, and it seems to kind of work, but, you know, there are specific applications where, it's, uh, uh, where, where this has negative implications for deploying them. But, and I think the third one actually is a, is a is a valid criticism that there's work being done on uh, uh, trying to figure out, you know, trying to understand these features better. But that is actually an issue for a bunch of applications. So, finally, that was most of the, um, what, semi-technical, there was the technical content. The last thing I wanted to do was, um, uh, you know, uh, I know that um, some of you are, uh, as many of you are grad students, I guess, or undergrads, grad students, and as you're making um, decisions on how to approach a problem, there'll be certain decisions you face. So what I want to do, since I've worked with, I don't know, probably like over 100 Stanford students at this point on, on this sort of stuff, what I want to do is uh, describe to you some of the most common questions that I've gotten from Stanford students uh, about, you know, philosophically, is this approach better, is that approach better? And let's just share with you some of my thinking. Right? And uh, I should say, the last part of this is all my personal opinion. Uh, all of this is highly debatable. In fact, I don't know if Jeff and Jan will choose to debate them uh, uh, when, when I say something they disagree with. But this, I'll just share with you some of my thinking about how I approach these problems. With a caveat, these are all my personal opinion, which may be wrong. Right? So one question I've gotten a lot is um, <coughs> probabilistic versus non-probabilistic models. And I think that um, 
uh, you know, probabilistic models way back in the history of AI, uh, like 50 years ago, most of AI was logic, right? And then there was a realization that logic doesn't capture a lot of phenomena we want to. So for example, if you want to model tomorrow's weather, well, fundamentally, we don't know what tomorrow's weather is. So if you want to reason, if it rains tomorrow, I'll bring my umbrella and the grass will be wet, whatever. Fundamentally, tomorrow's weather is unknown, so it has to be a random variable. And using logic to model that is just, you know, it just doesn't make sense. And so maybe 20 years ago, there was a big shift in AI from logical approaches to probabilistic approaches. And this has allowed AI to advance much further. I think it's a huge, huge step forward. And so when you have relatively small models where your nodes have a semantic meaning, such as tomorrow's weather, well then, you have to model that with a probability, right? But when your nodes look like that, when there's these generic layers of whatever, oops, sorry, um, does that node have to be probabilistic? That's been much less clear to me. And in fact, what I see is that, um, I should say, really, to Jeff's credit, a lot of deep learning was due to the initial work on RBMs and DBNs and so on. Um, but I personally have moved away uh, from probabilistic models since then um, for the reason that when I look at grad students that head down the route of building these crazy complicated probabilistic models, see many students end up you know, spending years fiddling with the crazy MCMC -MC sampling, fiddling with like Gibbs sampling, Monte Carlo methods, and, and these methods can get arbitrarily complicated. There have been students that have like, spent six years writing a thesis on some crazy complicated MCMC -MC method to do inference in these probabilistic models, rather than actually working on the model, which I think is maybe the more interesting part. So that's why at Stanford, I actually advise every one of my students to just use the deterministic models. Um, uh, to, to, I should say, there's a difference between deterministic and probably semantic. So you, you, can, you can do randomization, so you know, stochastic gradient descent, right, SGD. You can shuffle your training data, that, that's randomization. But I don't feel a need for um, the networks to have probabilistic semantics and to endow our networks with probabilistic semantics because the partition function is just so hard to compute. And I've not seen that much evidence that algorithms that are probabilistic um, uh, perform that much better. The one thing probabilistic models can do that the non-probabilistic ones cannot is generate data. So you can simulate new whatever, you know, generate new images or generate new um, fonts or whatever. So if that's your application, then that's fine. It's not clear that even a human brain can simulate new images that well. Um, so, so I've tend to, tended to build, a, build a models that do not necessarily have probabilistic semantics. Um, and and maybe another way I think about this is, you know, I'm still very much motivated by like biological inspiration, right? Can we, you know, mimic the brain in some vague way and, and move towards, you know, perceptual AI that way? And if you think about evolution, what does evolution do? Um, evolution searches in the space of algorithms, right? So DNA mutates, you have a different algorithm, a different piece of software. And, uh, uh, and, then, and then evolution, you know, hopefully finds an algorithm that causes intelligence, causes us to survive or abuse and whatnot. And only a minuscule fraction of all algorithms correspond to a probabilistic model, right? And so I personally find it extremely unlikely that the human brain, you know, is a probabilistic model just because evolution searches in the space of algorithms. Evolution mutates the algorithm throughout mutating our DNA and we have some algorithm that causes us to survive, I find it very unlikely that that algorithm corresponds to any probabilistic model. Right? Um, having said that, uh, uh, most of what we do optimizes some cost function. So I, I, I should say I also find it unlikely that uh, evolution is optimizing a cost function, the way that we think of gradient descent and so on. But uh, we tend to do that. I tend to do that because I find um, algorithms with cost functions much easier to work on and debug so we can search much faster through the space of algorithms. So what I think. Do you have examples of algorithms without cost functions? <clears throat> oh, algorithms without cost functions. Sure, quick sort. What's the cost function? You can, you can reverse engineer a cost function, right? But uh, um, uh, yeah, that's an algorithm. Um, what else? Uh, uh, take your favorite algorithm for generating random numbers, you know, like the, the box Muller method for generating Gaussian random variables. That's a piece of software. It's not optimizing any cost function. Is, is not a model, right? Um, 
So, yeah, please. So, I have a question about this. So, if, if, you, if you show an image and you post from the drawing, you probably get very different answers every time you show the uh, like visual cortex. Oh, so you show visual cortex and image, you get a very different answer every time? Yeah. Uh, yes and no, right? So, I mean, these experiments have been done, right? You can stick an electron into the monkey brain, show the monkey the same movie over and over, and you do get different results every time, but you also, you know, for some neurons, you do see the neuron very reliably fire at 15.3 seconds into the movie, right? So who knows what the brain is doing? The monkey is pretty distracted and thinking all sorts of things, but you definitely do see neurons that very reliably respond to that moment in the movie. Okay. So your intuition is actually the brain is, is it has missed? Oh, the brain is deterministic? No. It's not probabilistic. Oh, so, I, I, so again, I think there's a difference between um, deterministic versus probabilistic semantics. The, the, um, so I think randomization is fine. So stochastic gradient descent right, is, is, is an example of a, like um, when you're doing stochastic gradient descent, often you take your training set and you shuffle your training set. Right, and, and visit your training examples in random order. And that's one example of randomization, and it's fine. Uh, we randomly initialize the parameters of our neural network. That's randomization, and it's fine. The question is, do you force yourself to endow your network with probabilistic semantics? So are you gonna say that this is a random variable as a probability 0.7 of taking on one and a probability 0.3 of taking on zero? That's what I mean by probabilistic models. And that's what I personally, personal opinion, can't prove it have a harder time than leaving the brain does. Yeah. Uh, if we do not enforce the probabilistic semantic, uh, will, 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 will the model uh, eventually capture the statistics and uh, uh, the computation becomes more and more like a uh, probabilistic inference? Um, possibly, right? So, 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 uh, so you know, uh, <coughs> let me give an example. So, um, yeah, actually, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. So, so for example, a sparse autoencoder is not a probabilistic algorithm, like a TICA, topographic ICA. Um, and then it turns out, oh, here's another thing I see, right? Um, uh, you know, reviewed for NIPS a lot of times. Some of you write newspapers. Uh, let you know the secret. Um, when we're writing NIPS papers, what a lot of us do is we'll come up with a piece of algorithm, come up with a piece of software that works, right? Our grad students will test it out on data. Um, and then finally, you have a you have like a nice application. You can I don't know, in, 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 uh, uh, you, know, you have a computer vision system. They can detect object paths and put them together, or whatever. And then what happens? The student goes to goes to you, goes to, goes to me, goes to the advisor, and says, "Okay, I want to write a newspaper." Then I look at the algorithm and say, "Wow, this algorithm is a mess. Let's reverse engineer a probabilistic model out of this mess." And then what we do is we go and do a lot of math and try to come up with a probabilistic model so that the algorithm could have been derived from the probabilistic model. And then we write a NIST paper and it gets in. And then you read the NIST paper and you think, oh look, all these are probabilistic models. <laughs> but the reality is that was not how these algorithms were arrived at. And then and, you know, the most common trick right, is you have some cost function, there's some horribly messy cost function. You take e to the minus cost function, divide it by z, and there's your probabilistic model. right? <laughs> And, and, and I honestly feel like, um, I personally am guilty of this too. I, I feel like, you know, I feel like I've done a slight disservice by doing this. It, it, was, it was what it took to get a paper accepted sometimes, frankly. But I, I, I personally feel like um, the obsession with, you know, e to the minus cost function is, has, uh, I think probabilistic models serve this role, uh, but I'm not convinced that we still, we, I'm not convinced that we need them for everything. For small models, if you want to reason about tomorrow's weather, it has to be probabilistic, right? But just, but not for everything. Cool. Um, and so, oh, and, and so the other thing is uh, for the non-probabilistic models. Again, this is why I advise my PhD students this way. For the non-probabilistic models, often we define a cost function, right? Like the, you know, autoencoder reconstruction error plus a sparsity penalty or something, and having an optimization objective that you just minimize, that makes it much easier to debug your learning algorithm. And you can tell if the optimization objective is going down. You can tell if the learning rate is too big, it's too small, just check if you know, it's converging because you, you have a function you're minimizing. Whereas if you're doing you know, crazy MCMC things, if it doesn't work, you never know. There's just a lot more things to play with. And so what I personally have seen my Stanford students do is make much faster progress. Uh, uh, on, on building applications, for example, when using non probabilistic models, just because you have a well defined cost function, you can check the cost function is going down. Um, whereas for 
you know, rather than a partition function that you cannot evaluate, right? So that's why, but again, this I say really, this is my opinion, others will disagree. Right? And then the second thing I want to share with you, again, this is, because the nature is a rush, I'm just, I just want to share with you the common confusions I see and, and what I think. Um, another thing that I guess, you know, deep learning researchers like me have done is conflate two sets of results into one, and, and frankly, we've sometimes pretended that they were all the same thing, but they are not. So where does deep learning work? I think there are actually two results, and there are actually two fairly distinct classes of results uh, uh, when you look at these state-of-the-art blah, blah, blah results. One is we have lots of label data. It turns out that one recent innovation in you know, just being able to train massive neural networks is that when you have a ton of label data, which you do for some problems, you can then train the heck out of the network, and this gives you great results, right? Um, so I think, uh, I think uh, uh, some of the work from Jeff's group on speech recognition, I personally believe is in this category. I think some of our results on, you know, my, my Stanford group's results on uh, uh, images is in that category. And I think, you know, it was only in the last five years, right, that I think we built neural networks big enough because of parallel computing, GPUs, finally efficient numerical linear algebra libraries and what have you, that we could finally build massive networks that could exploit the tens or hundreds or millions of examples we have. So if you have a lot of training data, I think a good approach to building a classifier is build a massive network with you know, three hidden layers or something, and as many hidden units as you have the patience to stand, and just train the heck out of it. And that will, that's been kind of like a secret formula to getting, uh, to getting great results, okay? And, and, um, and so when we publish papers, you know, Guys like me often brag, oh, deep learning is save the alpha, X, Y, Z, and so on. And s some of the results are these just train the heck out of an approach. To me, in terms of the long-term future of our field, in terms of where I personally think deep learning should go, I'm actually much more excited about the idea of learning from unlabeled data. Um, and the reason is we have only so much labeled data in the world. Labeled data is expensive. Um, parents don't actually label that much stuff for their children. So I don't think the human, I, I learned this from Jeff as well, human brain doesn't actually get that much labeled data in the course of your lifetime. Um, you do get some for sure, but you know, your patient, your, your parents probably label five, maybe 10 cars for you, not 10,000, which is what our algorithms are using right now. Um, and so I think in order to hit the high levels of perceptual AI, I personally, personal opinion unjustified, believe that the regime to focus on is um, when we have a ton of unlabeled data. And I think if you want to make progress towards perceptual AI, that's what I think is needed, to exploit this infinite amounts of unlabeled data that all of us have, that probably is what the human brain, what the animal brain learns from for the most part. If you think about a dog, you know, a dog has an amazing visual system, but I think the, the dog puppy's mother probably doesn't label that much stuff, right? I'm sure it labels some stuff, but what the dog has is access to a ton of images and uh, can't prove it, but again, my belief is that it's all that unlabeled data that shapes to a very large part the dog's visual system. And if we could replicate that using unlabeled data, I think that's the way to make progress towards AI. So kind of a mere culpa, right? I feel like when we present deep learning results, especially outside the community when we're you know, busy trying to promote the field and brag about how much we're doing, we sometimes conflate these two results. I think the train the heck out of it is a great approach for if you want to engineer an application and, and you know, do something great, I've done that a bunch of times. But in terms of uh, where I personally am most excited about you know, long-term research focus, it's, it's actually that, right? Because it's more true to the, to the bigger AI dream, in my opinion. Um, all right, so just to wrap up, um, you know, you've started, started this morning, I was talking about this idea of large-scale brain simulations as, as revisiting of, of the big, big AI dream. Um, and, 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 and I guess, uh, maybe I'll share you a personal story. And I think I said earlier this morning, you know, when I was a kid in high school, right, um, I always wanted to work on AI, and that's why I entered machine learning. And then um, I went to Carnegie Mellon to do my undergraduate degree and learn how hard AI really was, right? And I, maybe some of you have had that experience too, like building human level intelligence seems really hard. Then after I became a professor, for many years, you know, if a, if a student would approach me and say, hey, Andrew, I wanna work on AI, 
well, as a professor, what do you do with a student like that, right? Well, you know, you, you scoff at them. You go, no, it's too hot, don't work on it, right? And you know, I'm, I'm frankly not proud of the fact that I was, you know, that, 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 that was discouraging students from pursuing that big dream. Um, and it was only, you know, five, six years ago, I don't want to overhype this because this is a hard problem. It was only five, six years ago, seeing some of the evidence from neuroscience, like the sparse coding algorithm, the biological comparisons, the deep learning stuff, the self-taught learning, unsupervised speech learning stuff, that really for the first time in my life, five, six years ago, I thought like, you know, still a really hard problem. We're not gonna solve it anytime soon, but maybe within our lifetimes, maybe we can actually start to do some large scale brain simulations and maybe just start to get a handle on um, perceptual AI. Uh, AI is much more than perception. The, the, the rest of AI, you know, thinking actively about, uh, uh, I know David has been thinking about that, but have, have some ideas, but I think the non-perceptual AI is much more wide open. But I think it'd be cool if we can um, really revisit the, the, some of the big AI dreams that I had when I was a kid. Maybe some of you had too. Um, and then finally, just in, since I'm being very frank in this, in this uh, you know, when, when people talk about deep learning, in the early days of deep learning, um, we're often getting flack for the deep. I, I think deep learning has been a great brand for the community because deep, ooh, it's just a great sounding name. Like what's not to like about deep learning? But I think it's really two ideas. One is um, the idea of learning multiple layers of representation. I think it's an important technology piece that you learn multiple layers of representation. Um, I don't know if that's a central idea. I personally, you know, like the I, I personally feel like the the idea of learning features from unlabeled data is of equal, maybe even greater importance. Uh, uh, you can have shallow unsupervised feature learning, deep unsupervised feature learning. But, but I think the term deep learning is much sexier than unsupervised feature learning, so we tend to use that as a brand for the community. But just keep in mind that, you know, uh, I think there are, there are, there, it's not, I think it was only recently in the last two or three years that we really saw the much stronger evidence that multiple layers of representation helps a lot. But uh, I think we've laid that one to rest, thank goodness. But, um, but anyway, we've been, uh, we've been doing this branding and PR a bit too much, maybe. Um, and then finally, we talked about scalability a lot. And uh, uh, I know you have various tutorials going on. And, and just uh, if you're interested, uh, that's the one that we put together. And at Stanford, I feel like you know, when, when the Stanford students work through that tutorial, work, it'll take you like a day to work through it, maybe a day and a half. Uh, but by the time, oh, actually, since you've heard me talk so much, it'll probably take you like less than a day now. But when you work through that tutorial and do the exercises, uh, you see that you got the right answers to those problems. And when you finish that, um, uh, uh, you'll be well qualified to, definitely well qualified to apply these algorithms to different problems. And uh, I think also well qualified working with, you know, more senior person to, to be uh, pushing forward to stay the art in deep learning. That's it from me. Thank you very much.